moves so slow, Rob. They <laughs> ten minutes so, and they you can only listen to an analyst or prognosticator uh, for uh, a couple three minutes, but ten minutes is way way too excessive. No, I looked I looked at the results. You handle that word prognosticator like yeah, a seasoned really, pro, yeah, Bill. Yeah, You're going to spoil yeah. me. Well, you, you have me so uh, gunshot about uh, uh, the prosecuting attorney. Well, you did say <laughs> prostituting attorney. <laughs> now, the great part about that is, is that when you said it, you looked up to me for mercy, and I did grant it. I said yeah. nothing. I said nothing, but the prosecuting attorney certainly <laughs> noticed that yeah. she did say nothing. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill Stubblefield, Mark Cram hey, here good morning, good morning, as well. Good morning. And during the uh, conversation, we also uh, see the phone call from Mr. Phil McCoy. Philip, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are well. Thank you very much. I agree with Bill. Uh, first round, they do it so late that I have to go to bed before too long anyway because I wake up way too early to stay awake all three, four hours of the first round, however long that marathon takes. But when you watch about a half an hour of the NFL draft, you've, you've had about enough because, I mean, we've got to bring out everybody and their brother to introduce the pick. Uh, everybody and their brother has to be saluted, recognized, thrown out in front on the stage. It's become, it's become about everything but the actual pick. It's a zoo. It, it's just too much. And then Goodell with his big hugs for everybody drafted in the first round. And then about six months from now, they're going to be fined their salary because their helmet got in the way of something or their socks were down or their shirt was untucked. He's going to just keep <laughs> siphoning money out of their paychecks. And then they direct those to NFL charities, which nobody really has a, a say over ex except the NFL. So I, it's just – it's too much of a show. Just announce the pick and let's move on. Yeah, and the other thing is, especially higher rank uh, – uh, higher picks uh, they're going to be the salvation of that particular team they're going to be the salvation of the league we hear that over and over and over again and a few of them do have good careers but so many of them do, do not, not have an impactive impactive career phil i know uh, as a Steeler fan we were talking earlier this morning at 6 30 you were pretty happy with the uh, draft selections of the pittsburgh steelers yes i was it was the, it was the direction of their draft yeah i talked to uh dylan a little bit when i called in and of course he wanted to know my take on on their draft i can't say that i have in-depth knowledge of any of the players that, that that they had selected but i like the direction you know that's two years in a row that they've used a first round pick on an offensive I'm sure they went second round as well and i think fourth round so being an old offensive lineman you know a good offensive line cures a lot of problems and you know whether it's giving your defense a little bit more rest or a, a more effective run game so I, I really like the direction that they've gone into and it seems like from from you know from the onset anyway it seems like they're all high character guys which is more of the stiller way you know they they put a lot into character stuff in the past so i i, I did i like their draft i'm like you guys though the production of it is a little much i've got too much going on i would just assume you know if you could do the first round in an hour show that would be great now i get it you know there's trades and so forth going on you gotta give them time it's like oop i didn't think they were going to take this guy now we have a chance to get that guy so let's see if we can make a trade so i get all that but you're not privy to that information until it happens so you don't get that same excitement just consistent uh uh analysis on whoever would be the next pick and how great they are like bill said how great they are but the fact of the matter is early on most of them don't have a noticeable impact some may have an impact you know take a, a, an offensive lineman he may have a really good year and you never hear anything about him and he made an impact on the team but you know the, the savior of a team rarely happens especially in the first year so you're, you're not going to get uh, any any noticeable difference based off of what the draft was but i, I did like what the steelers had had done and, uh, you know, the second-round pick of, of Zach Frazier, that seemed to be really popular, not just here locally in the state, but uh, across the country. That's what I keep hearing. When I want to see, you know, I go looking for what I want to hear, which is everybody say Pittsburgh did a great job in the draft. The first thing that pops up is Zach Frazier. So that, that, I'm, I'm excited for what. Yeah, a side story on that running parallel to the draft was uh, the bond uh, uh, 
bond issue initiative in Kansas City that was turned down big time by the voters. Uh, so we have this team that's a dynasty. Uh, and what's the future in Kansas City? It may go somewhere else. They're not going to go anywhere. I, I couldn't imagine Kansas City because they're, they're one of those cities that, you know, Kansas City and and Pittsburgh and the Giants and the Bears and, and the, even even the com- Commanders, I guess is their name now, e- even those guys, are they're kind of the staples of, of the league. So I couldn't imagine Kansas City leaving um, leaving to go somewhere else, especially with the recent success that they had. They just need to come off their wallet. I guess the taxpayers don't want to pay for a new stadium. So, hey, let the team do it. We, we pay the team. Let the team pay for a new stadium. Most of the time when they put these referendums up for a, a vote, the citizens vote down funding a new stadium, and for good reason. There's a lot more uh, things that are better spent on money than a new stadium for somebody else, right? Especially all the money that the National Football League makes. Hmm. But, Nas- the National Football League has more money than they know what to do with to make taxpayers pay for the stadiums under the threat that these people will leave is extortion. And if you if you look at what happened with minor league baseball, when yeah. every community was voting to fund a minor league baseball stadium, and what did baseball do? Pulled the rug yeah. out from all these communities, took the teams away because they were too... They were forced to pay a living wage to minor league baseball players, mm-hmm. so they re- they reacted by shutting down the minor league yeah, teams by really. by reducing the number of minor league teams because they had to pay better than substandard wages to to single A players. But Rob, referendums are being passed, but in other cities, such as referendum in Las Vegas, passed to build stadiums. Yeah, because exactly. they don't have one. They don't have one. The exactly. places that have yeah. one, they're and not that, looking to buck up that's, again. That's the point I'm making. Yeah, uh, that the ones such as Kansas City very well may be treading on thin ice if another town uh, passes a referendum to build this mega stadium. So I'm not sure I would say they're not going to leave. We've seen too many examples recently of a team leaving one city, such as Los Angeles, going or San Diego going to Los Angeles, then going to uh, uh, Las Vegas. So there's a lot of yeah. But jumping if, you, if around. you take away California, which is a different animal in and of itself, remove California from the equation. For the most part, franchises remain stable regardless of these votes because. What ends up happening is in Pennsylvania, they voted down a stadium referendum and they found a way to go around it and build Franklin, what I think what's I've called Lincoln Field in Philadelphia, and now it's called Akershire Stadium in, that, in Pittsburgh. It's beautiful. Yeah, but, 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 but so th- those are initially were voted down by the taxpayers, and the same is going to happen with Kansas City. They're going to find a new way to finance this. Well, I would argue that. Well, there's another. Uh, excuse me. St. St. Louis going to Phoenix uh, and Baltimore going to Cleveland. There's a going back a few years. There's numerous yeah. examples of teams leaving one area because they did not yeah. have a pre They did not have a conception they were going to be supported. But they they went to city. They went to larger cities that didn't have a franchise. Yes, right. That, that's and, and we've pretty much run out of larger cities that don't have mm-hmm. franchises now in this country. I mean, what are you going to go to Salt Lake? Yeah. For football? Yeah. You know, is that where they're going to go? Salt Lake, uh, they have a good basketball team there. It's a sports center. Yeah, then you, got, yeah. You, you got one team. I think there's a hockey team that's moving there yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, we're going to put an NFL team now in Salt Lake? Yeah. I could be mistaken, but I think it also requires their approval for a, a team to pick up and leave. And if that team is profitable to the NFL and they all do a profit sharing, if they're profitable to the NFL, you'd have a difficult time getting owners to approve that. But that's so a, I think that's also a requirement. That's a paper tiger. We've seen for years what the NFL was going to do to the Washington Redskins or Washington Commanders, and they there are a lot of bluster, very little bite there. Yeah, they, the Washington, they, they always dance around between D.C., Northern Virginia, and, and yeah. Maryland. So it's you know, they can move anywhere, and that, it's still the Washington franchise. That's not really a factor, but otherwise, I mean, the Rams went from Los Angeles to St. Louis because St. Louis lost the Cardinals to Arizona, and then they went right back to Los Angeles. Confusing. And then there's then there's uh, Elon Musk in China over the weekend, Phil. (laughs) What's he up to? Yeah, none of that will matter anyway because our Pittsburghs are winning the Super Bowl, and we know that Pittsburgh's not going (laughs) to lose that uh, lose that team. So. 
that's all that matters to us. Here. Phil, black and gold. There's, there's a lot going on uh, this week with the markets and money. We have a lot of earnings, a lot of uh, Fed decisions, and information is going to be coming out. Yes, and, and to start with, let's start off with, and I just saw this, Tesla up 13% in pre-market trading, I think based off of some of what Bill had just told us. Now, I was absent for some of the great day. Maybe that's why we had such a good day on Friday. I was absent, but as I looked through, you know, checking on the markets, I was like, wow, you know, this one day could save, and it did save the entire week, and it was based off of some earnings. So in my in my limited ability to research over the weekend because of how busy we were, uh, we were in Philadelphia, but in my, in my limited time, I see that uh, some tech companies introduced it, and then it kind of raised up a lot of the mega cap tech stocks that had struggled so much in April, and it gave them a boost. So I, I had said earlier, I didn't see a company that could kind of save us from this terrible April, and it's still been, I think, a negative April, just not as bad as what it was before. But when I said that, I didn't realize that the impact that introducing a dividend would do to uh, some of the overall tech market, and it really, really gave it a boost. And then heading into this week, we still have we're still very heavy on earnings and tech earnings as well. And of course, the federal is going to meet and give their outlook. And as we had mentioned this morning, the one fear that I have with the Federal Reserve, I don't know that they're going to say anything definitive. They've been really good at saying, hey, we're data dependent. It's going to be based off what the, the, the next few months the economy looks like and what we have to do in the pace of inflation and blah, blah, blah is what I'm starting to hear with all, all of that. But will they introduce the idea that rates could come back up again if this inflation doesn't subside? Now, we've kind of flatlined. I wouldn't say that it's increased to a level that we would be concerned, but it hasn't continued to fall like it did at the end of 23. So could they introduce the idea of yet another rate hike and then change our minds from when's the rate cut's going to be to, oops, when's the rate hike going to be? That could be deadly, and that could be a threat this week if they introduce that. If they shut that off, if they were, if someone directly asked that question, Steve Levy from, uh, I think he's from CNBC, typically he asks the best questions. If he asked that up front and they shut that down or say we're not discussing that at this point, that could be a boost for our market because that's where some of the fear is coming from is that rate increases could be on the table if we don't start to see more momentum on the downside with inflation. Phil, you can do all the technical analysis you want to do, bring in all the experts. There's one reason why Tesla stock went up, and one reason only. <laughs> it's because I sold my Tesla stock, <laughs> and that's what happens. Because yeah. if, if you buy a stock, well, it goes down. If you sell it, it goes up. That's the rule of investing. And, and I was I was kind of wondering last week, because I, I think you were you were a little bit bothered by the, by the good uh, couple days that I had and, and you're right, you know, what they said and what they did really didn't support that bounce that it got last week. And I, I could tell, I was like, Rob's a little bothered. And, Bill, we talked about you a minute. I said, I think you just want to give Bill a hard time about Tesla <laughs> the next day. Is that why you're upset? Then you confessed that you sold it. You sold it after <laughs> it had dropped. But rest assured, if you look over a one-month time period, Tesla is still down over 5%. Even with that bounce that I had last week, it's still down over 5%. And year-to-date, it still struggled down over 30%. So it's still down. It's just getting a bit of a boost because of some of the, what the forward-looking statements uh, they said last week, introducing the vehicles that are under 30,000, I think, was the number. That brings in a whole other group of people, a whole other group of drivers that would then be interested in Tesla. And if you get more consumers interested in Tesla and you get more on the road that could boost the infrastructure, the possibility of more infrastructure. We talk about that in areas such as where we live, where if someone were to even, you know, if someone could consider a Tesla, you also have to consider where do I get it charged or where can I gas it up? And I don't quite understand it. But if you see it on every street corner and every parking garage, and I'm going to use my experience this week in Philadelphia. We're, we're back and forth from Philadelphia all weekend. But everywhere we went, there were charging stations everywhere. There was nowhere that didn't have a charging station. There was many more charging stations 
constantly in the area that we were in Philadelphia, New Jersey, there were more charging stations than there were gas stations. Mm -hmm. So if you can get that infrastructure spread out a little bit more, then that, that could boost the EV market altogether. And I think that's where some of the optimism is coming from. It's not so much how much money are we going to make by selling uh, vehicles with small margins under $30,000. But if you've got more people driving them, there's more demand for the infrastructure. And if there's more demand for the infrastructure, there's then going to increase even on the upper end of it. But Tesla has a, a, a big bump. Uh, over the weekend as well, so it it, it is recovering some yeah. of its losses. It's up almost twenty two bucks this yeah. morning. Bill at one ninety thirteen. Yeah, Phil. Earlier before you started your uh, your full full throated discussion, uh, you mentioned that Rob's investment philosophy was primarily driven by whether it aggravate me or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It's the aggravate bill. Uh, uh, market strategy that I think Rob employs because I did you know I was running around the house I was doing stuff and I was texting Rob back and forth and he just wanted to know like what this doesn't make any sense why is Tesla doing so good this makes no sense whatsoever this is voodoo and I'm thinking why do you care and it wasn't bothering you so much for I didn't know I didn't even know that it what was going on but then I started to look into it and I agreed with him it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me on the surface uh, either and it still really doesn't you know I'm looking for reasons as to why that bump made sense. Now, the, probably the most logical answer is it has struggled so bad. You know, that didn't the bump didn't make sense, but also the fall didn't make a lot of sense either. But I still like why I was Rob so interested in this. So my perception was he just wanted to aggravate Bill Stubblefield the next day on, on the on the show. And but that wasn't it. <laughs> No, they, they had their worst quarter in 12 years, and the stock went up 15 percent overnight. I'm like, what? What, do, what is this? How, how does that make any logical sense at all? That still didn't bother you, though, the fact that you sold it. Well, yeah, for that, because <laughs> that's what really bothered me, of that, course. Yeah. Now, do you that's take it on you? Did you take that's advice on you. from? That's not on everybody else. Yeah. Do you it's take advice from Phil? Rob. It's not. Yeah, it's not. Buy high, sell low. It's the opposite. <laughs> well, when a stock is sinking like a rock and they just report their worst quarter in 12 years, with, under logical rules of investing, that's not the time that you get in on the no, stock. No, sir. It's going gonna, it's it's gonna to sink like more by all other standards. It. it sunk like a rock. It wasn't sinking. It had sunk and yeah. like a rock. And then you thought, let me sell it now. No, I, I mean, it, I didn't... So it, I, I didn't sell it at its, at its nadir, which was 138. I got out before then, but it made no sense as it kept plunging from where I saw it, sell, uh, sold it, that it would then bounce up as high as it's bounced in six months because they had their worst ever quarter. What business there, thrives on that kind of news? Sounds yeah. like sour grapes there, to me, Mark. There, there, there is the, yeah, no, there is the, the it's no place to go but up. You know, a lot of what we do is, you know, someone says, well, what does uh, Phil and John and Tyler do at your office? And you say, well, they manage investments and they give financial planning advice and retirement advice and, and so forth. But in, in reality, what we do is behavior management. And we try to we try to, to head off any of this behavior that Rob did, not, not after the earnings, but before the earnings. <laughs> Well, in my defense, I, I bought a long time ago, so I was I was securing my gains, Phil. And as you have said on numerous occasions, there's nothing wrong with taking your gains no, off nothing. the table, paying the tax, and being done with it before the next run-up comes. Nope. So I was no, following my not. Phil Kenny advice. Kenny Rogers has a song about it. You're yeah. right. Ken, yeah. And Kenny Rogers sings a song about it. The Gambler. It's reference to poker, but you can use it for, with the stock yeah. market as well. I and, locked in my gains. Yeah. And then going well, to... Don't the, be mad now. Don't look I can be. I can be mad. <laughs> I can still be mad. Okay. It'll shift into those things that fly. Uh, Delta Airline has led the, uh, the airline market for as long as I can remember. We have a new leader now. Southwest Airline has taken over the number one slot of the airline. In terms of number of passengers moved? As far as profit. Profit, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah as far as profit and someone who does fly quite often, part of the reason why I was in Philadelphia, uh, we do find that we, we our, as a consumer, it's a micro example, but as a consumer, my travel agent, Mrs. Beth McCoy, uh, tends to lean toward Southwest in almost every scenario. I can't tell you why. I don't know if it's ease of use for their website or if it's their baggage policies or whatever it may be, but we have noticed that over the years, in, a, in our in someone that flies a, quite 
for volleyball that we have started to lean heavily towards Southwest. And given a choice, she would go Southwest first. So there's something on that. I can't speak to, you know, I know they're, they're more profitable now than what they were before, but the, the question is why. And I, I'm, my guess is it's user experience and maybe some policies they have that's a little bit different than everyone else's. Phil, Eric O'Rourke. Your buddy said, "If I've learned anything, from, if I've learned anything from Phil this year, bad news is good news." There you go, and, and it has been in this environment. Eventually, that's going to change. We saw that change some earlier this year when we were everything was going really well. But let's let's frame this bad news. We don't we're not looking for bad news on the earnings front. We're looking for cracks in the economy, and the reason we're looking for that it doesn't have we don't want it to break. We want it to crack because that is some of the the measures that the federal Reserve will use to start decreasing rates. They'll see a crack and they'll try to try try to slow the bleed or slow the drain by reducing rates. And that's kind of the big catalyst that the market's looking for. But make no mistake, it won't be the day that they cut rates. It'll be a lead up to. So you can't really guess. You can't really say, well, I'm going to wait until they start cutting rates and then I'm going to throw all of my money in. Because the problem is you won't know until that crack is reported. And once that crack is reported and and the crack that the markets are looking for at the moment, I don't really know exactly the crack they're looking for. I'm thinking it's on the jobs front. But once that happens, that's when our market market should take a, a jump based off of what the perception that the Federal Reserve will do. Phil, I heard an analyst uh, maybe this morning, sometime recent, that said uh, we're going about this the wrong way. We have a very healthy economy, things, more things going right, and yet we're spending all the time chasing a 2% inflation, and which is not really a, a, a good, uh, good measure. What's your comments? I think he's got a point. I, think he's got, I mean, I think they've got a point. You hear that more and more if you're saying – And what he's really getting at is if everything is going well and nothing is breaking, we don't see a crack. You know, we're just talking about that crack. If everything is going well and and consumers are um, accepting these higher rates in this restrictive environment, why would we back off of that? We should wait for more than a crack and wait till it breaks. The problem with that is if you wait until the economy breaks, that's when you get into that recession, and they're trying to avoid that. They're trying to accomplish a soft or no landing, and that's why they would discuss rate cuts when they see the cracks instead of waiting for it to break, what he and a lot of other economists are also saying. And I think uh, John also agree with this to some extent if he's listening from over. But I think what, what he's getting at is if we start to cut rates based off of the slightest crack in the economy, we could introduce more inflation. And if that if it starts to come back up, it'll be even more difficult to get it under control. Bill, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Philip. Have a great day, sir. Thank you, guys.